When I was 22, I was completely invested in studying life sculpture and expressionist painting. I had spent years dedicated to learning these crafts from multiple angles. During that time, I was busy making corsets out of sewn together spliced beef jerky sticks and learning welding kind of badly. I was also creating paintings of complicated ghosts of kids, so that's what I was doing. But I had a blip in my path. Um, I failed statistics, actually. And I know as an artist, that seems kind of weird. Uh, a lot of people ask why that was required, but it is. Uh, and, um, I have dyscalculia. We have dyscalculia. Some of us are good at math, but not like most of the fronting parts skill set. And in failing statistics, I got booted from my recent transfer to Calvert, the art program. I was in the painting program at Cal. Um, I got newer acceptances from other local UCs that were closer to my home in Southern California, where I came from. And I couldn't imagine going back at all. I did not want to go back there. The college thing had been my entire ticket away from my family. So I was just not going to go back anywhere near. Um, I crashed a bit after that. I barely got out of bed for days, but I managed some remotely minimal effort that I needed to do to check boxes that I was somehow okay and not get hospitalized and, you know, just spackle it for that veneer like like we do. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Lori Anderson and her performances. There's one where she talks about depression and her severe depression, uh, where she couldn't get out of bed for a while. And in order to manage that, she got a job at McDonald's. And people didn't know she was Lori Anderson. And she described these simplistic things that helped her to get by that were really powerful, like the ability to fill a soda up in the specific way that McDonald's recommends, and being able to do that for the first time and having all of the employees just kind of gather around and clap. And she, you know, she's been an accomplished performance artist for who knows how long, but that was such a proud moment for her to manage her depression at that time. And, and I kind of get that when you're really breaking down at that particular point, small little tiny things just are meaningful. It's really hard. So, uh, that crash, I did remain pretty skillful in covering over any self-destructive stuff that I was doing. Kept out of sight. Nobody knew. I'm been historically really good at that. Um, it's a neat magic trick that we've been doing since basically forever. But uh, I did manage to acquire a few new healthy coping mechanisms, which is great in that time. And one of those coping skills was reading and drawing art comics. So I fell deeply into indie art comics zines. That's kind of like the... Um, so like the TikTok or the social media of the day, people like to think it's a new thing and it's a uh, crappy view. But like we really, we, we had zines that was the same thing. It was just on paper. Um, and it cost a buck or two. So I used to make some of those in high school, and then I used to that really read a lot. The more creative people were doing a lot of great things when I was in college, and um, you know. Uh, it's just a few bucks like on a bookshelf, or sometimes I would put a mine on a cork board at the university or high school, and other people would kind of trade theirs like that. And uh, they were just kind of cheap and photocopied or handwritten, frankly. Uh, one of the self-produced comics that I did land on at that time was called Cuckoo. Um, Cuckoo is by Madeline Ingle. I've got that right. And it's an entire comic about existing with DID, but it's not fantastical, and it's beautifully drawn, 
and I had never seen anything like that. I had never seen anything like that. Um, it was just like basic day-to-day explorations of what it felt like for themselves in a comic book form. Things like just buying cheese and my world exploded. I cannot tell you how much my world exploded because I really had no idea. I had seen nothing like this before. Um, admittedly, in high school, some friends of my uh, parents, some parents' friends of mine, when they would say that they thought that I had DID. And I think that I didn't take it well because they weren't particularly kind about it. And they were actually a little bit mean about it. And, uh, so I was upset with that reflection. I didn't really understand it. Um, I went to a rich kid's school. It was particularly white. It was particularly upper class. And I was not that kid. Uh, I was raised by a single mom who was a teacher. And I was just kind of stuck there through a messy divorce with my parents. So, to give you perspective, the most popular kid at the school would brag that they never wore the same outfit at all, ever, two times in a row. They only wore any outfit one time, and that was kind of their bragging rights. And for me, I sometimes got a new, what new to me, it wasn't new, but new to me outfit from um, a consignment shop, and I was so excited to have something new, I might wear it several days in a row, not really realizing you're not supposed to do that, it's not cool, so I kind of stuck out. Also, um, existing as somebody who's queer uh, also stuck out in that way, because everything was very straight, and, uh, I just didn't really understand that things that I did, like mentoring my peers on how to run or ride the public bus system if they didn't have a car in order to go to different places or teaching them how to shop in thrift stores independently so they could buy pink clothing if they were AMAB and their parents were not supportive around their individual color choice or dress preference. I didn't understand how much backlash that would get. It was just kind of in my own bubble. I was just like, well, you want to learn how to do this. So I figured this out myself. I'll figure this out with you. I think their parents would have preferred if I had been somebody who used substances and, and then introduced their kid to substances, which I was not at all doing at all at that time. It was pretty straight lace. But imagine the horror, frankly these parents of having their kids learn the bus system from somebody such as me. Um, The comic, anyway, back to that, had mentioned voice hearing. I have always, 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 always had complex voice hearing to those very little. And even in one of the organizations that I used to manage, there was somebody who was sort of talked to one of the clients and Stated, oh, well, they had voice hearing since they were five, five, three, two, whatever years old, and then everybody was aghast, like, oh, how horrible, how traumatic, how awful, and I'm sitting there like, well, silently inside, the, that, that, that's, that's me, and soaking in all of their reactions around voice hearing, who's allowed to have voice hearing, what does that mean and how bad is it? It's it's kind of hard to hear colleagues as a professional talk about these sorts of things as if there are never any people in the room and there's never any regard for that. Uh, something I have worked with pretty much throughout my entire career and have not quite figured out how to manage the complexity. But before that, with the comic, since I did always have voice hearing, I actually thought that everybody had voice hearing. I thought that was, frankly, normal. And uh, 
so to suddenly find out that this was an anomaly was a huge, huge revelation for me. I really, I really thought everybody heard voices. It just was so normal for me. My voice hearing is not particularly historically troublesome. And so it was a surprise when I realized that this is not not unique, but unusual. So, apparently, according to studies at Yale, at least from 2022, 50% of the population in the United States experiences auditory hallucinations. Um, and this is actually quite a significant number of people, if you really look at it. Um, if you really stop to count that, you're thinking about 15 people out of 100. 100 people is not that much. So if you're looking at a group and you're thinking, ah, 15 out of 100, that's, that's a chunk. That is not rare. That is not, in any universe, rare. So it seems that about, there's different studies that say different things about, but, um, between one, but three, five, I'm going to go with three percent because I've seen different studies between one percent and five percent. So three percent feel that voice hearing is troublesome enough to seek psychiatric help. And there's not really any clinical research that's been looking at the 12 percent of that 15 that hasn't shown up. There's not really anybody who's wondering what what do they mean? What do they think? What do they experience? I do think that does deserve a lot more attention. It's very interesting to me. We make a lot of presumptions on the 15% based on the 3% that come in. And I'm not sure that's entirely fair. But in returning again, I know I'm kind of circling back to my narrative about the comic, it really did blow things up for me. It put a bunch of pieces together that no one seemed to speak to. I mean, I'd already been seeing some therapists. I'd been seeing some therapists since I was probably pretty little. Um, yeah, some weird therapists that probably crossed boundaries in terms of that they were seeing my mom, and then I was seeing them. And, uh that's not really a great look. So uh, there are a lot of things I have learned about how therapists traverse boundaries that I take very seriously and I do not do because I have experienced what it's like to have that occur to me. But but uh, but nobody really asked me a lot of questions in relation to anything dissociation related, so I didn't really know how to speak to it. If you don't have the language for it, there's no framing of it hard to identify it in yourself and I think a lot of therapists seem to think conversely that clients should both either identify their symptoms and present them to the therapist so the therapist doesn't have to ask explicit questions but then there's the other side of the coin where if the client has researched the condition so that they can state the position and questions and the concerns well that there's often a question from the clinician side of whether they're influenced by social media and taking it. It's a very tricky and messy double bind. I don't think a lot of the clinical community has really observed or looked at in themselves what they want from their clients. So the comic outlined a lot of things I never even thought of to look at. I didn't know how to name and I didn't understand was actually a thing. Some of them were time blanks, uh, memory oddness that I had. I had been evaluated previously informally for schizophrenia twice and it was decided I didn't have that once. was mostly due to my history of verbal tics. Um, I'm very good at suppressing my verbal tics. And most people I interact with have no idea that I have them. My partner is very, 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 very aware I have them because we live together and then the pandemic happened. So we 
had been living together, like, I can't, I can't hide it. I can't hide that when I'm living with somebody. But um, in the pandemic, I can't hide even what I was hiding further. So they know absolutely everything about how noisy I am and how many ticks I have and what they sound like and what they do. And uh, they're great about it, honestly. They've been very, very accepting. I used to think I would never find a partner because um, I was like, what am I going to do when I'm with somebody and I can't get privacy to suppress my ticks and then have a place privately where I can just kind of offload them or so I do I shut them down. And then in private, I... Um, let them pop out, and they've been nothing but loving about it, and my, uh, they've been really cutely supportive and making buttons and t-shirts with some of the verbal ticks that I do, uh, and a lot of my verbal ticks are actually, and I wrote a bit about this on Twitter, are hidden by my kid parts, so my adult parts don't always tick, but if I'm blending and I'm more relaxed and I feel actually more safe, and things flow a bit more, my kid parts kind of go in, and then I will tick more, which is kind of a weird complication of feeling safe and uh, having a presentation where things that are weird might actually come out more that might make me feel a little bit more unsafe. But, um, yeah, I was trying to describe some of these things to my clinicians, and I didn't know how to describe them well because I didn't have any guidelines around verbal tics. I didn't have any... Understanding, I didn't even know that was, that's what they were. I was just trying my best to talk about them, and because I was so good at suppressing them, they didn't see them, and they thought I had schizophrenia. Um, until they just hung out with me a bit more and decided that I didn't have schizophrenia. But that particular experience was really, really stressful. And it's not like I think schizophrenia is bad. I work a lot with schizophrenia, which I will get into further into the talk. It's just that um, I didn't know anything about it at the time, and I honestly was afraid that that was what was going on with me. So I uh, I was worried that actually I would have schizophrenia, and as I had observed other people in my life, that this would get worse and worse for me over time. And in working with individuals with schizophrenia as I have currently um, I've learned a lot about it and I don't have the same feelings as I had about it previously I learned I have a pretty good skill set in helping people specifically with psychosis uh, I don't know if it's because of my dissociation um, I have just a really good back and forth with people and kind of tracking and managing complicated things even if to other people it doesn't make sense I feel like it makes sense to me and I can find ways to make it make sense for myself um, I have recently in the past 18 years managed several programs that specifically managed or worked with I guess it's a bad word worked with people who have psychosis um, you know it's particularly young adult programs so I worked with um programs that worked with young adults who were struggling quite a bit and I had small teams, case managers, clinicians, peer mentors, and most of those individuals were diagnosed with schizophrenia. And so I did a lot of training of individuals around how better to work with this because the current models are not that great. And I was a little bit lucky in those programs to just have more free reign to do what I thought might be better and I even had a little study on the work I was doing to see if it was better and the outcomes were extremely positive. I had a very significant reduction in hospitalizations and incarcerations and suicidality even when I got smacked during the pandemic with the changes that I started the structure of what I wanted to do, and the pandemic happened, and it kind of screwed everything up, because everyone was suddenly in crisis, and that wasn't something I can treat with, um, with therapy or yoga, and so 
but the, the, the skills and the concepts and the thoughts still worked. And that was very validating. And the training I gave to the clinicians that they have taken onward to give me feedback since around working with groups of people who have psychotic experiences and how to improve it just beyond medication has been really valuable to them. So that has been very fulfilling. Uh, but with my newfound knowledge around dissociation, back to the comic again, so I'm kind of looping around, I was so excited. I was so excited to find out that this was dissociation. Um, this was not the thing that I thought that it was. Like, I thought it was some rare and curious disease that could mark me different. Uh, this particular comic was pretty precise now, like, outlining day-to-day -day mundane aspects of what it's like to live with DID. And it was everything I recognized in myself, but it seemed nowhere. I really did not strive to be different because I had already been marked often as different and as a nerd and as an outliner, outlier, um, I tried fran frantically to blend in and was never very successful. So this had been an unfortunate side effect of the majority of my existence, no matter how desperately I tried to blend in, I stuck out like a sore thumb, even if I straightened my hair or I wore whatever daily uniform that the day was. It's just, it's like some random smell I give off that I'm different. So I'm not looking for anything new to be unique or different from. But honestly, I was excited to find a path to fix the daily onslaught of multiple anxiety and panic attacks I masked my way through every single friggin' day, all throughout the day with a smile even. Uh, it's a lot of us with the idea of OSDD is not uncommon. We can just kind of mask outrageous sensations and look like it's not happening. So there were the regular nightmares, my inability to manage leaving the house. If any person, no matter how harmless, was outside, the regular interest in images and constant feeling like I did not deserve to exist. I really, really just wanted all of this. But in finding a diagnosis, I was excited that maybe all or even some of these things could actually really stop. I was excited because I had already been in therapy for years and I had gotten nothing really from it. I hate to say that, but nothing got better for me. I thought, well, now I know and I've studied and I've checked things out. And so I am being proactive. I'm being thoughtful and I am being adult. I mean, I was like 22 at the time, but you know. I'm being adult. My current therapist will be so impressed and will want to know and sort out all of the things I found out about myself with me and then we can find a way forward together. What I was not prepared for was that my carefully presented and admittedly obsessive research, because I am also autistic so I do like to like track and detail things and keep binders. Uh, it was not engendering curiosity. It actually engendered derision. I'd spent months going through every available college library, reading several books a week on dissociation, and then ordering more for the library when those ran out. This was, there was not the depth and breadth of information on the internet at that time. It was really in its infancy, so I couldn't just do all of the clicks that people do. It had to be books, paper, things you held in your hand, and I was grabbing them by the handful. I took the DES and MID on my own from these same college library books, from these same college libraries, and uh, they turned out pretty significant. I, l I think they, I counted it in the first couple of months when I first started doing this because I had an overnight job at Suicide Prevention in San Francisco, so I just had a lot of time with myself, working by myself with silence. I read about 200 books in about three months span. 
on dissociation to try to figure myself out. I look at tests, I look at data. I grabbed everything and then I gave it to my therapist at that time. I thought I was doing the correct thing. I thought I was being a good client. I thought I was sharing my internal world and they would be so pleased at the work I had done and the transparency that I was giving them. I thought I was smart, proactive, and helpful in my mental health care. I really honestly thought my therapist would be proud. So imagine my shock when none of it was received that way. I... I have to pause because I it wasn't only not received in the spirit that I was giving it, but it was received in fear of me. And suddenly I was a fearful person to her. I didn't think it would work against me. But in our recent awkward relationship so she she just wasn't getting me. I kept trying to find ways to help her get me. If I just like bent my wrist this way, or if I did a backflip that way, maybe maybe she would get me and see me. And that uh, wasn't what ever could happen. It wasn't something I had the ability to figure out at that time either, as a twenty-year-old. So. I presented her with all of the stuff. And uh, out of the gate, I was told it was weird. It was weird that I sought out and read all of these books. It was weird that I read some of the books that she kept on her shelves. And this is kind of a thing I do. I don't know if therapists know this. Maybe I'm an anomaly in this. I don't know if other people do this. I read the books on my therapist's shelves that I see because I want to know how they think. And I'm a quick reader. I can do speed reading. And it seems important to me. If they are going to put those books on their shelves, they are doing it, I feel like, for a reason. And so I want to know what's in those books. But um, there were honestly not that many books on her shelves. It was not that huge a feat, but I wanted to know how she clinically thought in terms of her clients. And I revealed that to her, and she did not like this. She was a little creeped out by it. Uh, they weren't hidden. They were just out there. I thought that therapists put books on their shelves. I, I mean, I, I do on purpose. I thought that's why you put books out. You want to know, you want clients to know that that's what you want them to see. That's what you've read. Those are your foundations. Um, anyway, she uh, started to say statements that I was just looking for something to make me special, to make us special. And uh, we wanted to find things to make ourselves unique. And my heart kind of broke. She made a brusque joke that I didn't hear voices anyway. And I took a breath and I took a pause and I told her with a smile because I didn't think there was anything wrong with it at the time. Yeah, I did. I did hear voices. And when I told her that, was not prepared to find that she had put her hand into a claw that grasped her knee and she turned whiter than any white person I have ever seen turn white. She certainly was the whitest person. And my heart broke, yeah. And I didn't know what to do. I think she might have thought it was creepy that I was a little cheerful about it. I was cheerful because I was really wanting to help her have the information from me to sister with reducing, stopping my daily pain. 
experienced a lot of shit internally, daily, and I wanted it to stop. I thought maybe this was finally the answer. But God damn. Somebody, maybe, if I give them this piece and this piece and this piece, uh, maybe they could stop me from feeling suicidal. And if I could get a diagnosis, if I could possibly get the help, maybe I wouldn't feel these anxiety attacks every single day. I thought she would know. I thought I was completely naive. I really thought every therapist would have the education in a variety of ways that trauma might present. But instead, she was honestly terrified me, and she recoiled. I know I am not alone in this. In fact, I know I am far from the only plural person to find some piece of the puzzle and figure out what's going on somehow inside themselves and seek help. And because of the pain in the past and the confusion, seek help in enthusiastically but the enthusiasm is not held with curiosity it gets read as being pushy faking or mimicking social media and yes sometimes some of us do exaggerate our experience for clinicians who are not familiar when we are initially seeking a diagnosis because we want them to see us we are terrified that they will not. So we try very, very hard to show them everything we normally hide in probably a much more flamboyant way because we don't want to be missed. We are so tired of being missed. That it Sar and Colin Ross have written about individuals with the idea who present more flamboyantly to clinicians initially because they are so freaking afraid that their subtle presentations will not be seen and will not get the help. And it's pretty much an act of desperation. According to research, it takes an average of seven years for an individual with EID to get properly diagnosed and receive accurate help. Seven, 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 seven years. Seven years of paying therapists hundreds of dollars per session, which can run tabs up with like hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Seven years of unhelpful medication or possibly even really harmful procedures. ECT. I can think of a lot of others and I don't want to talk about it because I will get really upset. Seven years of being told by professionals that if you just got it together and you stopped being so histrionic and weird, this would all be fine. So in light of this, the desperation to make the covert over, no matter how it might seem flamboyant, it kind of makes sense when you really, 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 really want the pain to stop. But our push to be seen and our desperation to have someone see what's going on inside of us can get framed as more proof we are faking this diagnosis. Which results in all of the opposite actions and can create some really messy reenactments of our developmental years all over again. This is made more complicated in that many of us who seek help with those who experience, with those who have experience with multiplicity, we often can't see our own systems unless somebody else is there to kind of mirror it. Like we know it's there, we know things are happening, but we need a little mirror back and forth. 
it's far easier to see our own systems through the lens of another person reflected back than trying to manage our own pieces on our own. And that, that kind of sucks. I suppose that the push to be seen creates an opening where I myself changed courts from the arts and devoted obsessive amounts of time studying everything I could around dissociation to kind of get a foundation under myself. And through that, I have the skills to help others navigate. And I'm still working on it. The desire for a diagnosis for myself and many that I have worked with feels like confirmation on what we suspect in ourselves, but we really feel scared to claim. Like, do we have a right to claim this? There's already so much internal doubt and confusion that we are often scared we have it wrong. We are often scared we are somehow making it up, which makes that push in the office of the new clinician so very strong. We want to believe in ourselves, but we can't take our own perceptions seriously because of the abuse we have experienced often involve telling us our perceptions were not accurate or serious. And so that's part of the trauma work. But it's also part of being able to trust ourselves. And there's also fear. Fear that if we are wrong, we might have no path to feel better. A diagnosis for many can feel like a solid solution. But the issues around getting one, not so simple. So many have no idea what OSDD or DID look like. My system, and I don't know about others there, my system is extremely covert. None of us are very keen on anyone knowing shifts we present. And we are not even really open about names even amongst ourselves, even after a lot of work. We do a lot of hiding. So there's a double bind that many of us feel that we are in. Are we open enough and recognizable enough, even when we can find a clinician who might even know what a system might be? Are we open enough that they could see it? Are they open enough that they'd feel comfortable naming it for us? My system's not flashy. It's organized a little bit oddly. It's extremely observable by others who have their own systems. Everyone I know who has a system is somebody who says that they can kind of see what's going on inside of me. But uh, people who don't have their own experiences can't see us. And clinicians who don't have that connection can't see us. So it's been a little bit difficult for us clinically in our own healing, I suppose. Going back to the mirror concept, I was told by one clinician that I highly, highly respect, who's also a system, that the only way to see your own system is through a mirror with other eyes. And while I know, I know, I know this can be true, and I'm not certain it's true for everyone, and I understand that the need to be seen in relationship is valid and honest and true. It honestly made me feel a bit enraged because how many available clinicians are there actually even possible around to see us, to even believe in us, that we exist in this plural state, let alone to witness us as collective individuals. And how do we move forward to rely on these people as mirrors if we can't even find them? How does that help anybody start to know themselves and heal if they can't find somebody who understands what this even looks like or is? Most of my clinical work has been educating and changing people's minds around the fact that dissociation is something that actually and truly exists. 
most of my clinical work has been centered around pushing people to incorporate actually and real helpful trauma-informed baby boos into their treatment models and so stuff that works with CPTSD but does not work with dissociation or makes it work. And that has gotten me really, really good feedback from a lot of clinicians who have just been trying some basic things and have not understood why it's actually made things not better for their clients. We've collaborated on this and discussed it and we've integrated things that I've given them. We've been so grateful. So this needs to be more out there. These clinicians may think plurality that doesn't exist. Or they might just play act of fear that these symptoms exist however they exist in any category because of the way they've been taught to react about them. They may misdiagnose. And I've seen so many clients I've worked through in managing and community mental health who have been misdiagnosed. They may hear that this person, like a psychiatrist may hear that this person feels like they're a corpse and or they hear voices and they have suddenly decided that they have a psychosis or some particular issue that they haven't had through just these tiny bits of information and no further exploration. And um, then they provided antipsychotics that haven't been helpful. Very little therapeutic support very little exploration into whether this person has experienced a recent traumatic assault or rape or violence. They often provide trainings on how to ignore the voices and to make the voices simply go away. In my own clinical work over time, so much can be supported to improve the experiences of individuals with psychosis beyond just giving somebody a pill, which is what we tend to do with schizophrenia or other kinds of psychosis. Sitting and talking about the voices relieves really so, so much pressure. I created a hearing voices group for one of the programs I used to run, and the impact was phenomenal. The shame that each of these individuals felt in isolation around their own voice hearing started to break down because they connected with these other peers who they already kind of looked up to and thought that they were better than them but didn't, knew, didn't know what their insights were doing. Finding out that they also heard voices and were managing that was a gigantic game changer. I cannot tell you how it decreased suicidality. I cannot tell you how it decreased acting out rage. I cannot tell you how it decreased overall symptoms like anxiety or pain. It's, it's the connection. It's the lack of fear around difference. It's the desire to actually pay attention and care that starts to create a change. And that change is the experience of feeling seen and feeling seen by somebody who actually cares about you. This is the feeling of not being alone, which shouldn't be unique, but in our culture, and in, in here anyway, it, it is. There's very little talk about patience and curiosity in terms of sitting with and for individuals who present with a desire for diagnosis. Patience and being curious are defining tools for any skilled therapist. There is some need that wants to be met, and it doesn't have to be framed in malicious attire. When a client is pushy, clinicians often frame it in terms of what game are they trying to manipulate, and very little around why are they so desperately wanting to connect around this. And that dance can increase in between the one who wants to be seen and the one who thinks that they are being pushed into something that is not true. That power play is rarely helpful for either party. Being able to take a breath, being able to take a step back, it's the therapist's job, whether it's achieved or not. It's 
still their job. Being able to slow down the intensity so that it resembles something to be collaborative and curious about, something we don't need to punish the other person about, it's, it's sadly needed. We don't have a lot of that in our profession. It's a skill I honestly would like to see much more in many of the mental health professionals I see around me. A lot of the recommendations to manage the complexity of dissociation is to find a therapist. And generally, yes. 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 In an ideal world where it was affordable and free and accessible, da -da 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 -da, I would totally agree with this. But the barriers are significant. So until we address the barriers around even adequate access to care, this is just fancy lip service to many. Even just looking at the United States where I am located, according to the National Institute for Mental Health in 2020, overall the literature shows that individuals in racial, ethnic, and minority groups also generally have overall less than optimal access to care. These individuals are 20% to 50% less likely to initiate mental health service use and 40% to 80% more likely to drop out of treatment prematurely. Adults with mental illness tend to lack insurance coverage at a significantly higher rate than those without mental illness. In an NIMH survey of patients with psychiatric conditions, 61 61 61% of those not receiving mental health care listed cost as a barrier. That's a Access to care is for the rich. It should not be. But this is what we have in the United States. Currently, the estimated shortage in the United States is about 10,000 to 20,000 psychiatrists and only 25% of primary care practices have on-site specialists of any sort. And a good God, that is never going to include, I should say today, but I would hope that it, it does, the specialists don't include dissociation specialists. They don't. We're last on the list. I think we all know that this is the case and only 10% of mental health patients are treated by a psychiatrist. And then I want to add an extra little caveat, like are they even being treated correctly? Because I have witnessed so many clients treated incorrectly. Nobody's asked the correct questions, nobody even thought of the correct questions, nobody even thought of the questions to ask. And so they've been given a different diagnosis than maybe what they have. And with the institutionalization that a lot of individuals feel, because if they resist, they're going to be labeled as borderline, which as I believe there's nothing wrong with being labeled as borderline. I do very well borderline personality disorder clients. It's a way to shut people down. You didn't want to take this medication. You were complicated is a problem with you. Whereas it really should be any individual patient's right to question the treatment and to partner with the treatment that they are given. It's not wrong to say no. Actually saying no is how a lot of us get better. So we're not even talking about dissociative disorders and all these statistics. So according to Nestor Hawkins and Brand in 2022, patients with DID are at a high risk for engaging in dangerous behaviors such as self-harm, suicidal acts, and only 28 to 48 percent of individuals with dissociative disorders receive mental health treatment. Patients that do pursue treatment are often misdiagnosed recently repeatedly, sorry, not recently, repeatedly hospitalized and experienced disbelief from providers about their trauma history and dissociative symptoms. Lack of dissociation-specific treatment can result in 
poor quality of life, severe symptoms, requiring utilization of hospitalization, and intensive outpatient treatment, and high rates of disability. So think about that. That's the norm. And in the same study and publication, it was reported that 97% experienced more and more barriers to treatment. 92%, 92% of the individuals in this particular study stopped treatment with a provider due to either limited insurance coverage, poor therapeutic alliance, or disbelief in what they were presenting, their symptoms as they were presenting them and trying to get help for them probably being told that they were faking it and maybe being told that they got their symptoms from TikTok. 92% of individuals stop treatment because of disbelief from providers. That's an astonishingly high number. And yet having been in the field of mental health for as long as I have, in community mental health in particular, I am not astonished but kind of crushed, depressed, sad. It is unacceptable. I want to say this again, and we should all say this together. It is unacceptable. And there's a reason. There's a reason that people on TikTok make diagnosis cakes. I'm sure you've seen some. I know that they have been put up as something as questionable. It started in the autism community. But it's gone to other diagnoses. It's not about the possibility of being different and being seen as different and being unique. It's about knowing that something is different about who you are and you are trying to find it and you think you have found that piece but you aren't sure and you want to be sure and you want that lens to help you find out if you are correct and that diagnosis can feel like a world of confirmation and relief for me if I'm going to put it in some, something stupid, I once had a sinus infection for two years. Two years. I know. It's insane. I don't want to disgust you, but, like, literally safety code orange stock. And I kept going to the doctor, and they kept saying I just had allergic rhinositis, and they kept giving me nasal spray, and they kept saying it's not working, and it wasn't working, and it wasn't working, and it wasn't working. And each time I came back, I got treated more and more like, there was something wrong with me psychologically once somebody thought maybe I had allergies oh no no asthma and I was so excited and uh, because I was so excited I think this was about 18 months in they freaked out on me and they're like eh, 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 eh. I don't know if I mean I honestly don't know if it was something in the allergy medication that somebody seeks out that they were worried about. I was just, I was like, I just want this to stop. If it's, I don't fucking care what it is. If you have an answer, if you have a thing, I want this to stop. It's been two years. And um, so then they backed off their diagnosis of it being asthma. And it wasn't asthma. It turned out it was a, it was a sinus infection. It was a sinus infection that no one had caught. And it finally got caught because I got so, so, so very sick. I needed two rounds of antibiotics. And uh, it went away entirely. <laughs> it's still on my chart that I have chronic rhinitis. And um, it's hard when you have something and you know it there and you keep pointing to it and the more you point to it people say do you want that you're crazy it's 
just want to sink. You just want that sink in for a little bit. You should be able to talk about your symptoms, how long they've been going on, and what they feel like, and what you've tried, and what hasn't worked, without feeling like you have to risk being called crazy. And there's nothing wrong with crazy, but you know, it generally gets used as a way to shut people down. That's all. So, while we clinicians do talk about self-diagnosis quite a lot, and I understand there can be issues with self-diagnosis, we rarely seem to focus on the damage of clinical misdiagnosis. And I see that so often in my career. I have witnessed horrific damage. I have witnessed horrific damage from clinical misdiagnosis that I have attempted to intervene on. And as a clinician, I am honestly not that stressed about self-diagnosis. It's something I have expected and have witnessed and have experienced from the clients I have worked with during my entire career. And I may not always agree with the diagnosis they feel that they have, and that's okay. But the fact that they are thinking about it that much and they're interested is really valuable to me. I'm so excited, honestly, even if I really don't think it's a match, that they want to think about it and they want to read about it. It's a positive sign for our clinical work together. In my community mental health work, we even have protocols that help us collaborate with self-diagnosis um, on how to manage it if we don't agree. Most people, unfortunately, don't use them. I have found them to be so helpful. Um, I was trained to look at what people reported that their own diagnosis was. I mean, we might even look at the DSM together. We might, like, look at, match things up. Like, why do you think it's this? And why do I think it's that? Have a really open, transparent dialogue. Um, because oftentimes... What I experienced was that an individual would self-diagnose when it, when it was in, different than what I thought it was. It was because the diagnosis that I thought it might be was really riddled with a lot of shame. And they didn't want to have that. And they kind of honestly already thought that they had it, but they were afraid. So what I could do in this process of bouncing back and forth between what they thought it was and what I think it is, kind of undercut some of the shame with how I talked about what they were seeing and what I was seeing, and we could collaborate together. We would find places to be on the same team, um, you know, and they might cling to that thing that feels like it has less stigma attached, and I'm just like, I'm not going to do a power struggle with you. This is not really the point of mental health care. It's not that big for me. But I do want you to know what I'm writing on your, your treatment plan, and I do want you to know what I'm writing on your assessment, and I want to share those with you, and I want us to feel good about it together. So it's really not about the condition stigma. It's about how others view it and the behavior around how others view it. So as I said, power struggles are not useful. And they're not conducive towards mental health treatment. So I would normally take whatever language that they would give me, and I would fold that into our collaborative treatment plan together. Usually they actually saw a lot of the things that I saw, and it was just scary to name it. So we would fold the literal pieces of the language in without the fancy clinical words into the treatment plan and the assessments. It was very direct, and that felt much more comforting to them. And in this way, we could forge something together that didn't feel like it was covert, it didn't feel manipulative or controlling, or that took power out of their hands. It could really relax to them. They felt like they were in the driver's seat, and I also didn't feel like I was compromising my clinical vision or my license. So self-diagnosis has been a part of 
how I have navigated mental health for years. It's not stressful or a crisis for me. Um, and many of us who are OSDD or DID, honestly, without self-diagnosis or self-education, we would not have the ability to push back on clinicians who decided for us without any of their own clinical reading or research or training. So this is possibly what we are dealing with is a trauma and dissociation issue. If we did not do self-diagnosis and steer, and some of us have trained our own clinicians because we get one that could already have training because there's not that many of them. If we didn't do it, We didn't do it. We would just have to <coughs> accept something that wasn't helpful or real. We would just be succumbing, which would be a reenactment of a dynamic that we had experienced with kids over and over and over again, succumbing to a false narrative that didn't fit who we are, that defined who we are. Clients are taught to succumb to the authority of experts. What do we do when the experts are wrong? And what do we do when this is more frequently the case in the terms of impacts around complex trauma? Like, really, what do we do? I don't think putting all of the authority in the diagnosis hands has helped our community very much until there are more people and it's widely understood and it's widely respected and it's widely educated amongst clinicians and clinicians have that power and understanding I don't think it's safe for the clients to just hand that power over which I think is what is being asked we are being asked to not consider self-diagnosis. However, even if there's the ability to find somebody who actively, actually understands the diagnosis, there might not be a personality fit. Generally, much of what pers uh, pushes that. generally much of what pushes a successful therapy forward is the magical personality click between a therapist and a client. And that fit might not remain consistent over time, which is okay, as all of us are subject to fluidity and change. We might have different needs at times, and somebody might be wonderful in one point, and it might not work quite well somewhere else. So while the therapist I worked with the longest understood OSDD and DID very well, and they were amazing for just a man managing my initial landscape and stability and safety. I mean, they were really able to hold my secret meltdowns I regularly had and things that got just stuck, and when I would come in and I would be mute, they were able to manage that. And while our different selves would appear, Once we got a little more stable past the trauma stuff, we had a little hard time because they weren't noticed by her because of our intensity to, and our drive to hide ourselves. But she also just didn't know how to see it. And we wondered if she believed us. And she, we wondered if she thought we were even correct. We started to experience floodings of self-doubt, even though, as I said earlier, any OSDD or DID system would clock us right away. That continual drive to be legitimized as existing through a professional who's trained has weight, and I think it's something that we should take seriously.
when some of the people I work with finally have the courage to say who and how they are to me, when they are able to do that, it can be so terrifying for them. And I respect that and I understand that. It makes sense. Being seen when one is OSDD or DID, and there is so much historical trauma, it can be dangerous. Being seen can mean so many complicated and not good things. Hiding anything from the self was the only way to survive. So to be open with somebody, it takes a lot of courage is not always well received when it, one is open about the self or selves the providers can be met with derision it's actually unfortunately pretty common and that derision feels like annihilation all over again all of the self-doubt and fears of having risk to be open are right there on the surface it is not easy for most of us to talk to a clinician and let them know who and how we are, even if we pop up with a, some sort of mask of bravado. It's generally a kind of armor to see if we can manage to talk about this again. A diagnosis, whether right or not, can feel like some kind of official record of having been seen. Like literally seen and gotten. And having been validated, which is why some of us do seek it so hard. And there are individuals who perceive themselves as more than one, and they really want that validation. And they're correct in their personal perception, but they may not have traumatic symptoms, the complex history, or the internal desperate turmoil with the clients that I work with that they experience, and that's okay. A correct self-perception should not be dictated dogmatically by some removed authority. That has been the root of social control for thousands of years. The ability for an outside force to define who and what you are, as well as who and what you are allowed to be, you shouldn't give that away to someone else. But in this case, these folks may not qualify if you don't. You might not qualify for severe dissociative disorder like OSDD or DID. So that's okay. There is no need to push for some of the diagnostic criteria. There is no need to push for excavating traumatic undercurrents when they may not be present. Validation of a medical diagnosis from a licensed authority figure only really factors in when A, you want to understand yourself through a disease model perspective. You want to find healing through that. And B, you possibly want your current and future insurance to assist with the billing of your psychotherapy. As many of us in the clinical world often say, the DSM is generally and basically a billing manual. And while the reification of professionals in terms of seeking something that can officially define you all for yourselves has been indoctrinated in many of us throughout our lifespans to include a multitude of circumstances ranging from whether we weigh enough, whether our social media presents correctly, how to view into details of our psyche, not everything needs to be stamped by a psychologist or even a lowly F MFT like myself. You can define yourself for yourself. This is your embodied right as owners and orchestrators of your own unique psyche. Don't ever let anyone take that away from you. Don't ever let anyone take that away from you. And as Nick Walker has said, Dr. Nikki, especially, especially, don't ever pay to have someone take that away from you. Thank you.